welcome. How are we doing? Excellent. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors, and uh, I'm just really glad you're here. We're in a series about the tabernacle, and last week we started this series, and um, I think it's going to be a fascinating series. I think we're going to learn a lot about Jesus by studying the tabernacle. And one of the things that's very interesting to me is that uh, um, as we begin to look more and more into the Old Testament, we see more and more of the New Testament. We see more and more of Jesus. In fact, I say all the time, every word in the Bible is about Jesus. And you're going to see that even though we're looking at the tabernacle today, we're going to be looking a lot at Jesus. And last week we, we talked about how God decided because he loves us that he wants to dwell with us. Even when we were totally messed up. And we talked about how they had just basically worshiped a golden calf. And yet he still says, I want to come dwell with you. I want to be with you. I want to go where you go. I want to know what you know. I want you to know that I'm just not your God up there. I'm actually here with you. And we're going to do life together. The problem was he was like really holy. And they were really not. In fact, he was so holy that if they had stepped in his presence, they'd have died. And so he says, look, I can't just come dwell with you. You've got to build me a place. There's got to be a place where people can come in as sinners and eventually approach a holy God. There's got to be things that happen before you in your sinful state can come anywhere near me because I'm too holy and you can't survive. So he said, I want you to build me a tabernacle. I want you to build me a portable sanctuary. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it. And the reason I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it is if you don't do it right, you'll never be able to approach me. And by the way, you're making a copy of what's in heaven, the tabernacle in heaven. And so we have to make it exact. Now, today I'm going to be talking about a topic. I'm going to go ahead and put up the disclaimer now. Um, We're going to talk about some graphic stuff today. So if you are a young child and I don't see any, so we should be good. Um, It really shouldn't be that graphic to us, but it is. So um, it's necessary for the thing and we're going to talk about it. Now, the purpose of the tabernacle, and we talked about this last week, it was not a place to go like we think of a church. When we think of the tabernacle or the temple, we think, well, it's just a big church service. No, it's not what it's about. In fact, the tabernacle had very little to do with what we would call formally church. That happened in the synagogues around the cities. They would read scripture, they would sing hymns. The temple, the tabernacle, the tabernacle eventually became permanent as the temple. And basically the way it worked was, yes, they sang hymns, but they sang them up on the way to the temple. And yes, they taught scriptures and they quoted scriptures, but they did it on the way up to the temple. Once they got to the temple, there was only one thing to be done. Deal with your sin so you can approach God. That's what the temple's about. It's not a worship place where we think of singing songs and hymns and teaching. The temple, the tabernacle is very much about you are unholy, you are a sinner, you want to move towards the holy of holies, and before you can do that, we got to deal with sin. That's what it's about. And so when we think of this, we got to understand that the purpose of this entire thing was for an unholy group of people to be able to dwell with a holy God with a sin issue as a problem. It's a bit odd to us today. But God said that one of the things that's required for you to approach me is the death of an animal. Animals are going to have to die. They're going to be slaughtered at the command of God. We struggle with these things. You see, we live in an end times, a time when the Bible tells us that people are going to start valuing other things more than humans. Animals are going to become more valuable or as valuable as human life. God didn't ordain it that way. Never said that. But in our culture, in our society, we take better care of stray pets than we do stray people. But animals weren't created in the image of God. And God ordained that they would pay the price of sin. Actually, it's the blood of these sacrificed animals 
that would pay the price of sin. So you may be asking, like I ask a lot, what's with all the blood, God? Why is the tabernacle arranged to where the first thing you see when you enter is an altar full of blood? Animals being sacrificed, animals that are being slaughtered. When you walk in, when you pull back the first entrance curtain of the tabernacle, the first thing you see is a whole bunch of dead animals and blood being poured everywhere. Why, God? Why is it that throughout Scripture, throughout the entire Bible, it seems to be covered in blood? Blood runs from the beginning of the Bible all the way through. Blood is involved in every major doctrine of the Bible. You take blood out of the Bible, there is no meaning to it. It's incredible when you understand exactly what it means that God ordained that blood would be part of our culture, our life, our relationship with God. So you may ask yourself, God, why the dead animals? Why the slaughter? Why do priests look more like butchers? Why are you so detailed about exactly where the blood needs to go, exactly how to handle the blood, exactly where to put it? Each offering, it tells you in a different way what to do with the blood. You got to do it exactly the way God says. Why do they sprinkle it on the altar? Why do they put it on the table of incense? Why the Holy of Holies? Why does the Ark of the Covenant get covered in blood? What, what is up, God? Well, in order to understand this, like most things in the Bible, we have to go back to the very beginning. Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and all over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on earth. And then the scriptures tell us something that's very interesting. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is where we get our 21st century minds into the text and completely misunderstand what's being communicated. The term naked here in Hebrew is not talking about sexual awareness or consciousness or being exposed sexually. The term naked here has a completely different meaning. They didn't know anything about clothes. They had no one tell them which parts of their body should be covered. The term naked here is speaking about spiritual nakedness. What it's telling us is, is that they were open. They were fully exposed. There was nothing hidden between them and God. Their actions, their intentions, their thoughts, their ambitions, their motivations. It was all laid out for God, and there was nothing wrong with any of those things. They were fully open. They were fully known to God. He could be in their presence because their thoughts were holy. They were spiritually people in the image of God. And they weren't ashamed. They had nothing to be ashamed about. They didn't even know what good and evil were yet. They were in a relationship with God. When they entered God's presence, there was nothing, not a single part of them, not a thought, nothing that made them feel anything other than completely accepted and completely loved. They were naked spiritually and without shame. And they knew God. And God walked with them. God dwelled with them. That was his original intent, by the way. That we would be people who could live open to God, that we'd have nothing between us and that we could walk and dwell with him and we would go where he goes and he would go where we go because he loves us and we're created in his image and everything's wonderful. In fact, God said it's very good. Man, imagine what that would be like. But then man sinned and everything changed. 
They now knew good and evil, and they knew they were evil. They hid from God because they knew they were now spiritually exposed. They had done something to hurt the heart of God. They were now spiritually naked and ashamed of what they've done. And everyone minus Jesus who's been born on earth has been born in that nature. Spiritually naked and ashamed before God. They thought they could hide from him. It's funny, we do the same thing. They, they thought that they could just hide. God, God wouldn't know. That's not what happened. They tried to hide physically, but they were still fully exposed. God in his righteousness and holiness had to give them a just and appropriate judgment. Genesis three seventeen, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat of, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The punishment of our sin is death. From dust we came, and now to dust we must return. It's for everyone who sinned, for every one of us. Every one of us born into a sin nature is headed to the dust. It's the way it is. We're all naked and exposed. We all have a destiny to dust. The moment they sinned, they died spiritually. I'm immediately now separated from God. I no longer have God dwelling with me. I no longer have his spirit guiding me. I no longer know what he wants me to do. I've got to try to figure it out all by myself. Because we rejected God. We said we could be our own God. So he could not stay in our unholiness. So he pulled back. And now we are left on earth trying to figure out the world on our own when we were never designed to do that. We were designed to have the Spirit of God teach us all things, lead us into all truth, guard us, protect us, move us, gift us. And instead we said, no, God, I got this. Don't need you. I'm good. Okay. But know that because I'm a just and righteous God, the punishment of sin is death. Spiritually and physically. It's that nature we have that keeps us from being able to be in the presence of God. The fall of man was a huge fall. So God had to do something to allow Adam and Eve and their descendants to be in some form of relationship with them. He had the choice. He could have just said, this is just a bad project. I'm just going to end it right now. I'm going to start over. No. He loves us. I don't know why. It makes no sense. He has a love I don't have without him. His love is unconditional. He decided he was going to love us. Go figure. He's God. He can do what he wants. But he knew that he also had to be just and he had to be righteous. And even though he loved us, he couldn't ignore the sin that we've done or the fact that that sin brings death. So God finds himself in a relationship with dying people that he loves. I don't know how many of you have experienced being with dying people that you love, but it's heartbreaking. In order for God to meet justice and righteousness, something or someone had to die. Somebody had to pay for that sin. God could not be God and not make something die. The curse is death. Genesis 3.21, And the Lord made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Where did those garments come from? Dead animal. First sacrifice in the Bible. You have sinned. We have to cover you spiritually and physically. This animal is going to take your place. 
He drove out the man, and to the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree to life. That's a whole other sermon. But Adam and Eve were clothed in the skin of an animal. He wasn't just covering up their physical nakedness. He was using the substitutional death of an animal to cover their sins spiritually. Critical to understand. If you don't understand this, the entire tabernacle of the Old Testament makes no sense. Only death can pay for sin. The punishment is death, so death must be the payment. You may be thinking, well, how can an animal pay for the death of a human? When a human is in the image of God and an animal is not, we'll get to that. But for now, just know the punishment's death. Something has to die. In order for them to continue to interact with God in their fallen state, their sins had to be temporarily covered by a substitute. Why? Why didn't God just make them do some good stuff and make up for it? Clean up the garden, maybe. Pull the weeds. I don't think there were weeds in the Garden of Eden. Why not? I mean, why not? Why not just tell Adam, be extra nice to Eve, and because of that, I'll go ahead and I'll just forget this sort of death thing we talked about. You know, a lot of people are living their lives right now thinking that's what's happening. But they're being graded on some kind of curve. And if that's true, then it might be nice for us, but it means the God we follow is not just. It's not just. He has to be just. Why? Because a lot of people are crying out to him for justice. If the punishment of sin is death, and it is, then the only way justice can be met is through a full payment. Justice is met when something else or something dies. It's the same today and forever. God never changes. No one comes into God's presence without the payment of death for their sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, the judgment was that their life would be taken from them. Once they sinned, they were instantly spiritually dead. Yes, it would take years before their flesh body died spiritually. But they were instantly cut off from that right relationship they had with the Father. They died the moment they sinned. It was not new for the people of Israel that blood had a central place in the worship of God. Animal sacrifices were established early in their history. It's very possible that every Jewish person knew that the animal was slain in order to clothe Adam and Eve, their parents. Genesis 4.2. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering from the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Many have wondered, why didn't the Lord accept Cain's offering? Why was he so pleased with Abel's offering and not Cain's? And I think there are likely two reasons. First of all, we don't know what this offering was. In the Old Testament, there's all kinds of offering. There's sin offerings, there's grain offerings, there's forgiveness offerings, there's all kinds of offerings. But most likely, this was a sin offering. First, Abel gave the first of his fruit, born from the flock, and Cain gave an offering in the course of time, suggesting he gave leftovers. Second, and for our purposes here, Abel's offering was a blood offering. Cain's was not. Something to consider. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. 
And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Blood in this expression, voice of your brother's blood. God is not saying that blood can talk to him. What he's saying is, is that this blood that has been poured on the ground, you could change it to a simile. It's like your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground for justice. It's like a voice calling for revenge. The sacrifice and shedding of blood, according to God's commands, could only be done by the priests in the temple, in the tabernacle. In fact, we're going to learn that if you sacrificed an animal in any other place, or you did it without the oversight of the priest, the punishment was death. God took this stuff seriously. Had to be done in the right place in the right way, by the right people, for the right purposes, and with the right heart. Animal sacrifices could only be done in the tabernacle, in the temple, under the supervision of the priests. That's why when the temple ended in 70 AD, so did the sacrifices. There was no place to do it. You weren't allowed to do it. That's why people think when the temple's rebuilt at end times, sacrifices will return. The Jewish people will have a place because they don't yet know the Messiah. This sacrifice and shedding of blood, according to God's commands, can only be done by the priests. And in the priestly book of Leviticus, we begin to read about blood. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Notice that the atonement is for your soul. It's for the spiritual part of you. The blood of shed animals that covers the sins of the Israelites is not going to solve their flesh death problem. But it's going to save their souls. We have a new word to understand here. It's called atonement. It comes from the Greek word kippur, which means covering with a price. That's what atonement is. Covering with a price. The life of animals, we are told in this scripture, and the life of man is in the blood. If a creature loses its blood, it loses life. I have given, God says. Don't miss that. I have decided, I have decided that the life is in the blood and the blood is going to be a temporary payment for your sins. I've decided that. It is a gift to you, that passage says. God decided that the blood of something that died sacrificially would have the supernatural power to atone for us because God said so. No other reason. God appointed blood to have this power because it represents the life of a creature. A life can only receive atonement, covering with a price, by the sacrifice of another life. The atonement is the act of God whereby sins are covered by the price of shed blood. Shows that the wages of sin have been paid, and God can once again look among his people with favor. The pouring out of a sacrificial animal's blood was God's provision in the old covenant for the atonement of sin. Now many times you hear people say that they are saved by the blood. That is the blood of Jesus. That allows us to go into the Holy of Holies. But that's only true because Jesus died. Let me repeat that. That's only true because Jesus died. When you pull back the entrance to the tabernacle and you look at the brazen altar, you don't see a whole bunch of phlebotomists. You don't see people drawing blood. You don't see people giving blood. Blood only atones for sin if it comes from something that died. It's the death, not the blood, that brings its transformative power. 
Let me repeat that. It's the death of something represented by the blood of that something that brings the transformative power of paying for your sins. When something of flesh dies, it bleeds. The death is manifested by the pouring out of that blood. Jesus didn't just cut himself and say, hey, here's my blood, use it. The blood only had power because he died. Because he was a sacrifice. He didn't just cut himself and cover us in a unit of his blood. Without death, justice is not met. Remember, God says that something has to die. He didn't say something has to go give blood. Blood alone will not work. It has to come from the death of something that's innocent. But it wasn't just the blood of a dead animal that covers our sins. God also ordained that blood of sacrifice had to be held in the highest regard. It is the ultimate valuable thing. It is something that innocently died for you. Treat the blood with respect. Under the law of Moses, God arranged a way for the Israelites to have forgiveness of sin by blood sacrifice, managed by the Levitical priests, foreshadowing the ultimate priest who would come and manage our sins for us. The shedding of blood was an important part of that because the wage of sin is death, we know, and the blood represents life poured out in that death. In Hebrews, they say it this way, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So these sacrifices to the Lord were acceptable offerings, but they were temporary. The blood of bulls and goats was a good but temporary institution. It wasn't perfect because they had to keep repeating it. Had to keep getting replaced. Every time they sinned, here's another lamb. Got to come back to the temple, drag my lamb, got to kill it. Hebrews 10, 11, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What the author of Hebrews is saying is, look, that's the old covenant. It doesn't exist anymore. Jesus is here now. Sacrificing animals, I don't care how many you sacrifice, is not going to do it anymore. The ultimate sacrifice has already been given. The ultimate blood has been spilled. The old covenant is no longer here. It has been fulfilled by the new covenant in Christ who died as your sacrificial lamb and poured out his blood for you. And it's only through him that you can enter to the presence of God. But at the time, in the pre-Christian era, it was a way that people could take the guilt of their sin and still enter into the presence of God. They accepted what God had provided and were forgiven by a graceful God. The practice of atonement, animal sacrifice, is seen as one of substitution. An animal's blood is offered in the place of the sinner's blood to remove the guilt. However, the symbol did more. It wasn't just a reminder of our sin. Thankfully, God loves us and doesn't want to kill us. The animal is symbolically offered as a ransom payment that would cover them. The Israelites saw the blood of an animal as the life of that animal. And since blood represents life, the opposite of death, its sprinkling around a temple was treated as a detergent that can symbolically cleanse the temple of death and of sin and of the things that are covering it and of defilement. The end result is, is that the presence stays quickly and quietly in the midst of the people of Israel. Now, according to the different sacrifices, it's handled in all different ways. In some sacrifices, the, the animal is sacrificed, filleted, laid out, and burned completely. Other ones, it's thrown 
blood is directly out of the vessel. Other ones are told to touch certain parts of the altar. Other ones are told to let the blood pour out on the ground. Every sacrifice, God tells them not only what to sacrifice, what to do with the sacrifice, but exactly where the blood needs to go. Sometimes they would go to the altar and throw it in the form of a Greek letter T. Any blood left after that was poured out at the base of the altar. In sin offerings, blood is never thrown, it's sprinkled. The priest dipping the forefinger of his right hand into the blood, then sprinkling it from his finger by motion of the thumb. Oh, right side. This method is an atonement for sin. It's very specific. It's ordained by God. It has to be done correctly. And God was extremely serious about how every drop of innocent blood is managed in the temple and by whom is allowed to manage it. Atonement is a complex theological topic. But it's basically restoration and reconciliation. What it meant was is that God could dwell with the Israelites. He could maintain his right relationship with them even though they were sinners. The substitute was not offered by humans hoping to appease a volatile God. Please understand this. It wasn't that the humans got together and said, hey, let's build a place for God. And let's take some innocent blood. And instead of choosing children, let's just choose some animals. Let's kill them and see if we can appease the gods. This is the complete opposite. This is God saying, no, I want to dwell with you. I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you what needs to be done so I can do it. I'm going to tell you what to sacrifice, how to sacrifice it, who can sacrifice it, where to sacrifice it, what to do with the blood. This is me, God, telling you how I'm going to communicate and connect with you. I don't need your favor, I just need your surrender so that I can save you from yourself. So when they entered the tabernacle, the first thing they see is the brazen altar. It would have been surrounded with animals, beautiful, perfect animals in the prime of their life. Every animal was being led by an adult male. The priests in their formal garments were covered with blood. All day long they slayed innocent animals and cared for the blood in a way that honored God. Innocent life was being shed for the sins of the people. At the brazen altar there were dead animals, dying animals, gurgling animals, yelping animals, gasping animals, and animals with no clue what's about to happen to them. And they're all innocent. Remember that this was God's design of a place that would be necessary if unholy sinners were going to dwell with holy God. It's a place where people are covered of their sins and able to dwell with God. The innocent blood is the first thing that has to happen as they take any step towards the Holy of Holies or towards the tabernacle, the inside part, the temple of God. And there's blood everywhere. It's on the altar, it's on the horns of the altar, it's poured out on the ground, animal carcasses are laying around, they're being burned on the altar, dead eyes looking everywhere. We have nice cleaned up pictures of it, that is not what it looked like. It was an ugly thing. It was a trash dump for dead lambs, dead sheep, dead goats, dead birds. Just one offering I'll read to you out of Leviticus, if you want to read all of them, Feel free. Leviticus is full of all these different offerings. Here's one. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this to you. I just want you to pay attention to the detail of what God says has to happen here. He shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. You don't go to God empty, by the way. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, It shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the side of the altars that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces, and the sons of Aaron and the priests shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head, the fat on the wood that is on the fire on the altar." But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. 
And the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with pleasing aroma to the Lord. That's just one. Not only that, but when you entered the temple, it wasn't like everybody was bringing animals. They were. But don't forget, you had to have yours. Everyone saw you walk into the tabernacle again. Everyone saw you pick out a perfect lamb again. Every saw, saw you walk up to the priest again. They saw you put your hand on the head of a lamb. They saw you publicly declare that this lamb was going to die because you once again sinned. In one year, the male of the home was required to bring daily, weekly, monthly, and annual sacrifices for the entire family and the sins of their family. How many? Well, just a regular year, 32. 32 times. You would go to the temple with a perfect lamb, hold its head, and let him slit its throat. Why? Because of your sin. 32 times a year. Minimum. Do you remember how many Israelites were with Moses in the wilderness? Numbers, remember that book? Numbers 145. So all those listed of the people of Israel by their father's houses from 20 years old and upward, every male able to go to war was 603,550. If we assume that each house had four to six men of that age and a father overseeing that household, they were sacrificing about 8,000 animals a day. 8,000 animals on the brazen altar a day. How do they do that? Do you remember how many priests there were? 22,000. This was a bloodbath. This was not a little bitty lamb being led up to a clean altar by a priest in perfect clothing. This thing is a slaughterhouse. It is covered with blood. When you pull back that curtain, I'll get to it in a minute, but you know what you're going to see because you can smell it two miles off. You can hear it See, in the Bible, we don't smell or hear. This thing was horrible. It's like walking into hell, which is exactly what God wants you to realize. Okay, keep going. I spent a fair amount of time in my life around blood. It's part of what I do. As blood leaves the body, it's bright. It's kind of attractive in a weird way. But it quickly starts turning dark. It quickly starts congealing. It quickly starts smelling. It has a foul, rancid odor to it. Old blood just smells bad. It turns black. Let me assure you that that altar was covered with old blood, dying carcasses, and a smell that would have knocked you over. Also notice that they are washing the colonic contents of these animals before they burn them. Don't miss the full image that God wants you to see of the consequence of your sin. None of this is by accident. God wants you to see your sin looks like hell. And oh, by the way, those lambs that are up there, those eyes that are staring into nothing, that should be you. Because that's the punishment for your death. We don't teach blood in churches. Not in 21st century churches. People want to leave. I don't want to know about this. Take the blood out of the Bible, there is no sacrifice. There is no atonement, there is no salvation, there's no reason for Jesus to come. The sound and smell of the tabernacle was evident from really far away. The one thing that every Israelite knew when they approached the tabernacle was that they were sinners and something had just paid for their sin. They could never approach God without a payment a covering for their sins. It, payment was and always will be innocent blood. You can't skip around it. You can't go past it. If you went past the brazen altar without a blood sacrifice, you dropped dead. Can't skip it. Neither can we. You can't approach holy God without some form of innocent blood covering you. 
Now, hopefully, you and I know that blood of animals can't really take away sin. That's why these had to be repeated all the time. They were temporary, requiring constant renewal. All of the many blood sacrifices seen throughout the Old Testament were a foreshadowing of the true, once and for all, final sacrifice that would be offered to the Israelites and who would never, ever forget that without the shedding of innocent blood of a death sacrificial animal, there is no forgiveness. This brings us to an important thought. There's no way the death of an animal can pay for the sins of a man. They can't. God knew that. Israelites knew it. They knew this was a temporary covering. They knew it was only by God's grace and mercy that they were allowed this temporary, insufficient sacrifice for their sins. Don't miss that. That hell they walked into, that ugliness they saw at the beginning, it wasn't enough. Should have been people, not lambs. Should have been their neighbors, their friends, themselves. Why did God accept an inferior substitute? Why did he accept animal blood and didn't require human blood since the curse is on humans and animals? The reason is, is that God knew one day human blood would be shed to cover the gap that has been made all these years. God knew the Messiah was coming. He knew that there would be a price paid for everyone's sin through the death of one person. And because of that, in his grace and mercy, he accepted a partial substitute in anticipation of the real one. Remember, everything in the Old Testament looks forward to the Messiah. Everything in the New Testament looks backwards and forwards to the Messiah. In order for the sins of man to be punished in a just and complete way, human blood blood has to be shed. Innocent human blood from something that has died. Someone. True atonement for human sins must be made with human blood, someone who dies in the flesh. He knew that Christ would come. He knew that his payment would be for the sins of everybody in the world. Jesus came and he died and he, in his sinless sacrifice, did away once and for all for the need for repeated animals to be slaughtered. So now brings us to our question. Another question. Why the crucifixion? Why that method of death? Why didn't God simply have lethal injection? The requirement was just that something dies, right? An innocent thing dies. You could kill it however you wanted, right? Why not just do lethal injection or hanging or an electric chair or something? Why? I mean, you could stone him. That's not as bad. Why a cross? Why the crucifixion? Here's why I believe God chose for Jesus to die the way he did. He wanted Jesus to look just like the brazen altar that he was. He wanted Jesus on the cross to be covered with blood. That his blood is poured out for you. That when you see him on the cross, when he is lifted up, you realize your sins had to be paid with innocent blood, his innocent blood, and it's ugly. And it's horrible. And it looks just like the brazen altar. Only this time it's permanent. And this time it's real. And this time it's the last time. The Lamb of God is on the cross covered in blood because God chose for Jesus to die that way. Blood is not only a symbol of life, it is life. Blood is messy. Blood is not something that people take lightly. God wanted us to understand just like he wanted them to understand the severity and graveness of our sin and the cost of what it would take for him to buy us back from our sinful state. You see, when you opened the tent and you walked in and you saw the brazen altar and you saw the dead animals, the one thing you were aware of was something had to pay for your sins. And when you gazed upon the blood of that animal, you knew it was you. There was a substitute. In the same way, when you pull back 
the New Testament and you open it up, what you see is the blood of Jesus. You see it poured out and you know how innocent it is and you know that he took your place. The only way God could dwell with us in our depraved state of sinful flesh was for Christ to suffer the most bloody, most excruciating, most graphic death he could think of so we would never lose sight of what happened on the cross. Blood was in the mind of God a perfect way to display the supreme cost of our salvation. Once you see the importance of blood in Scripture, you begin to recognize that it's everywhere. Let me just show you this. I'll run through these quickly. You can look them up later. Like I said, blood is involved in every doctrine in the Bible. Blood is required for the forgiveness of sin. Matthew 26, 26, and he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. Blood is the price paid for our redemption. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Blood is everywhere in the Bible. Ephesians 1, 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. 1 Peter 1, 18, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation. Blood was also the propitiation that Jesus paid it all. There is no distinction for all have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Propitiation, he paid it all. He didn't leave anything uncovered. It is through his blood that we're justified. Romans 5, 9, since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Blood is what allows us to come near to God, Romans 5, or Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Blood brings reconciliation in our relationship, Colossians 1.19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Blood is what sets us apart, what sanctifies us. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purifies our consciousness from dead works to serve the living God. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify people, note this, through his own blood. Blood is what cleanses us. If we walk by the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 7, 14, I said to him, you know, sir. And he said, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Blood is what gives us access to the fathers. Hebrews 10, 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter holy places by the blood of Jesus and the new and living way that he opened up for us the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Finally, it is the blood that brings victory. And they have conquered him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love their lives even unto death. So now that you understand more about blood, you understand that in Jewish culture, blood was to be treated with respect. You understand that they were told never to drink blood, never to eat things of blood. In fact, remember in Acts, when they asked them, should we make them be Jewish? Remember that? And they came back and they said, no, just make them do these things. One of the things they said was, don't eat blood. Okay, remember? Don't, don't eat something, don't eat blood. Don't eat the life of something. Okay. Now imagine, as Jesus was towards the end of his time on earth, and he's sorting out those who really are understanding spiritual things from those who just want to know physical things. And he turns to them, and he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Drink my blood to a Jewish person? Are you kidding me? This would have been shocking to his audience. You weren't, you weren't even allowed to consume any blood of a ceremonial clean animal. That's why you burned it all up. Surely the blood of a human is forbidden. Every pagan culture in the world sheds blood of humans for their rituals. But Jesus is sorting out those who are spiritually discerned and those who aren't. He's speaking about spiritual things, not physical things. He's telling them you need to drink in and spiritually consume the life that's been poured out for you. You need to embrace what I did for you. In your spirit, in your soul, you need to drink in the payment that happened. You need to understand what I went through for you. In fact, he tells us, one of the things I want you to always remember, I want you to always remember that I poured out my life for you. Innocent lamb, it's my blood. I died, I resurrected, but my blood is what was poured out for you. It's the price that was paid for you. You see, I'm your substitute, Jesus says. I'm the innocent one that went to the altar of the cross for you. It's my blood that was poured for you. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Notice that the blood of the covenant is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood was the final sacrifice and death resulting in innocent blood being poured out for the sins of man. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remind ourselves to spiritually take in the life that was given for us. To not waste a single drop of the price that was paid for us. To walk up to the table like we're walking up to the tabernacle and we see the brazen altar and we see the problem, we see the death, we see what was paid for us. And we know that we have to get past that altar to get back there to where God dwells. Every time we take communion, we're to come to the table and know, i got to get past that cross and the blood that's on it for me so I can get back to where God is. I can't skip it. I can't go around it. I can't earn my way into it. I have to receive the blood. And so when we take communion, there's a part of it it's all about the blood. The blood of a sacrificial lamb who died for you. And Jesus tells us, 
in so many ways to remember the blood. In a minute, we're going to celebrate communion. It's for those who have put their trust and faith in Jesus. If you're not there yet, it's okay. Just sit and think about what I've been talking about. But if you're a follower of Jesus, he said, I want you to do this. I want you to do it frequently. We do communion here about once a month. We do it every Monday night. Why? Because we need to remember the blood. We need to remember the price that was paid for us. We need to remember the sacrifice. And as you take communion today, I want you to really think about the blood. The communion table for us in many ways is like those who walk to the brazen altar. No matter what you do, you have to embrace the fact that innocent blood is shed for your sins. Nothing has changed for us. We're no different than they were. If we want to get to God, we've got to go through the blood. That's why we celebrate communion. In fact, he tells us, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Have you ever thought about who you proclaim that to? It's yourself. I'm reminding myself of the innocent blood that was shed for me. And I'm going to do it every time until he comes back. Because I'm never going to forget. Let's pray.